So how are QAM and APSK related? And here are the constellations for quadrature amplitude modulation and amplitude and phase shift keying, where we're showing 16 constellation points in each case. And the first thing to do is to remind ourselves what these constellation points actually mean. So I always like to think and draw the picture where the constellation point tells you the amplitude and the phase of a sinusoid. So a sinusoid with a particular frequency, that's the carrier frequency. So in this case, here is a time domain sinusoid that's actually going to be sent, and it's going to be sent according to which point gets selected from the data. And it's going to have an amplitude and a phase. And the phase shows here that the sinusoid doesn't go through zero at time equals zero. It has a phase offset and it has a certain amplitude. And both of these cases, we have points that have varyingly different amplitudes and phase. So for example, all these four points in the middle have the same amplitude, but of course they have different phases. Uh, in the QAM case, we have three different possible amplitudes. The amplitude to this point here, the amplitude to this point here, which is the same as that one, and the amplitude to this point out here. What's the difference with amplitude and phase shift keying? It also has different amplitudes and different phases, but in this case, there's only two amplitudes. So the inner four have the same amplitude and all the others have the same amplitude as each other, different to the inner ones. So the real main difference here is the placement of the constellation points, which means the selection of sinusoids that you can select from with your digital data. Now, when we're saying how are they related, well, one thing to look at is to make sure that the powers are related when you're comparing the two different schemes. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of having your points on a square grid, like in QAM, and in this arrangement here where they're all on circles in amplitude and phase shift keying? So the first thing, as we said, to make sure they're equal in terms of their scaling and their power. So if this is a uh, Typically, we, we normalize this to say uh, values of one and three for our different uh, in phase and quadrature. Uh, this is the cos component and the sine component, which add together to give the overall waveform. So if we normalize to one and three, uh, then over here, we normalize the inner square points to be one. Uh, then what do we have to make the, how big is the circle so that they, when we send you the easy, using either of these, we use the same power. Well, of course, uh, we can work out the average power from sending from here and make sure it's the same as here. So what's the average power from here? Well, all the quadrants are equal. So we can just pick one quadrant and we look at that. And so what's the power, average power in here? Well, if we sent this one, it's one squared. The, the distance here is, according to Pythagoras, one squared plus one squared square rooted is the distance. So the power is one squared plus one squared. So this is the power of sending that point. So we add to that, we need to average over these four to find the average power. This one here is one squared plus three squared. And there are, of course, two of those in this quadrant. So there's plus two of three squared plus one squared. And then also there is, of course, the power of this one out here, which is three squared plus three squared. So plus three squared plus three squared. And this has to equal the average power over here. So what's the power in a quadrant over here? Well, we've got this inner point as well, of course. So there's one squared plus one squared. Uh, and then we've got these other three, which is plus three times. Well, the power of these is what we're wanting to know what the size of this circle is. So we'll call that x. So we'll say x squared. And you can now uh, work out from here to make this the same and so that you can relate them to each other. You can find out that x equals 3.56. So if the circle radius here is 3.56, we're going to be able to relate the two different constellations to each other and look at performance. So this is uh, one thing, the shape of the constellation and making sure that the powers are the same. And now we're going to ask ourselves, well, why do we have different uh, shapes and what are the advantages? And really the main thing to think about when thinking about amplitude and phase shift keying, why it's got its advantage is when it comes to nonlinear amplifiers. So in the receiver, especially for the communications like satellite communications where it's a, a long distance communication, the received signal is going to be coming in very weak. 
And so then you're going to need quite a bit of amplification. Now, amplifiers are not always linear, and that's the important point here. So let's consider a nonlinear amplifier, and let's consider it in a case where you have, uh, for example, a steep slope so that you're getting a bit of amplification. So this is input uh, and this is output. This is output of the amplifier. And I'm going to consider one particular case uh, and, and we'll be able to use it to see the difference between these constellations. So let's consider a specific case where there's quite a bit of gain such that the from the small signal we're going to get uh, our inner points coming back at 1, 1. So they've gone into the channel, they've been uh, attenuated to a smaller value, and then we put it through an amplifier so that our inner points, let's say the slope of our amplifier is designed so that the inner points come back at this position 1, 1. But in order to do that, because it's such a steep slope, because let's say our signal is, or we're considering signals which are very weak, let's look at practicalities in amplifiers and this is called a th and, and the main one to be considering about is the thresholding effect in an amplifier nonlinear amplifier and let's say for example we had a thresholding effect just to pick one particular one to make a point very clear let's say the thresholding was at 3.56 let's say it was at that value 3.56 so if that was where the thresholding happened then any signal when it was when the inner part is linearly amplified to come back to be here out to one and everything else is linearly amplified up to 3.56 and beyond then is thresholded. Well, let's think of the effect of this amplifier on APSK. And the effect would be, well, our inner points are gonna be coming back at to one and one and they're all fine. And the outer points all the way up to being the ones that are coming out at 3.56 are all linearly amplified. So all of these points are also linearly amplified. Any signal that's, that's uh, coming in at a voltage higher than that voltage and therefore needs to be amplified beyond 3.56 is going to be thresholded to 3.56 but because none of them exist for APSK we're absolutely fine and there will be no change to our uh, where we have to put our decision boundaries. We'll look at decision boundaries just in a minute. What's going to happen for QAM? Well, these signals are going to be fine because they're in the linear part of this particular amplifier. Same with these ones here because this, this distance out to here uh, is less than 3.56, but this point out here is going to be thresholded at 3.56. So in the receiver, this if it comes through this threshold, this point here is going to be scaled down because of this threshold to a value which is 3.56 rather than uh, the square root of 18 because as this is 3 squared plus 3 squared uh, which gives us 9 plus 9 and the square root of uh, 18 is the distance long here which is bigger than 3.56. So if this QAM went through this thresholded practical nonlinear amplifier this point would be squashed in closer. Now let's try to understand the effect of that and why that's a bad thing for QAM and why it's therefore preferential in these scenarios to use APSK. Well let's think about these decision boundary regions. So in QAM how do you do the reception? Well the reception is based on the decision boundaries and you find out your decision boundaries by looking at the distance between the nearest points and putting a line which is uh, at right angles to the line connecting those two points halfway between them. And so for example for QAM clearly we can see that the decision boundaries are going to be at 2 if we didn't have this nonlinear amplifier. Uh, the decision boundaries would normally be here uh, and along the axis of course and between these ones here at minus 2 and of course halfway between uh, these uh, here um, in the uh, in, in the quadrature direction as well. So these are the decision boundaries here uh, for QAM. You receive them separately in the in phase and quadrature. So you can use a superheterodyne receiver to get the cos component, and then you simply use these decision boundaries, vertical decision boundaries. The same for the quadrature component with the sine component, and you're using these horizontal decision boundaries. It makes QAM reception very simple in the receiver. So that's the advantage of QAM. The problem is, if it comes through a thresholded nonlinear 
amplifier, then these vertical lines will not hold once it's gone through that threshold. Because as you can see, as we said before, this point here will be closer in after it's been thresholded. And therefore, this vertical line at the top here has to be moved uh, because this point is now going to be coming closer to its nearest neighbor points. And so the decision boundaries for QAM after it goes through a nonlinear amplifier are not as simple anymore. And it makes the decision boundary selection and, and calculations much more difficult for QAM when you have practical nonlinear receivers amplifiers. So that's the main downside to QAM is if you have scenarios with these nonlinear amplifiers, QAM is harder to work out the decision boundaries. What about APSK? Well, the decision boundaries here, it's not exactly a circle in the middle, but I can just approximate it with a circle in the middle. So there's the decision boundaries between the inner ring and the outer ring is essentially, is it bigger than this circle or less than this circle? And then for the uh, for the inner points, it's lines along these axes here, uh, because then if you're in this region here, between this circle and these points, then you're going to be picking this point and this one and so on. And out of this, it are, they are lines radiating out from the center uh, at equally spaced between the decision points. So we can see here the decision boundaries are actually radiating out from the center. And what that means is if it goes through a nonlinear amplifier, then these decision boundaries are not affected, or a thresholding nonlinear amplifier, then these decision boundaries are not affected by this threshold because the threshold is going to compress all of this into the center because that's what this is happening with this compression. And it's not always as extreme as this where it just exactly hard limits. Obviously, normally there'll be a curved here, but you just uh, this is the ex more extreme case. Uh, and you can see then this compression in towards the center does not change the, at least for the angles, does not change those decision boundaries there. It does change, of course, this circular boundary here, but that's just one parameter that squeezes in or out depending on the shape and where this thresholding happens and, and the, the shape of this curve and where this thresholding happens. So it's much more, uh, much less effect on the decision boundaries from a nonlinear thresholding amplifier on APSK compared to QAM. And that's really essentially the advantage of using APSK in applications such as satellite communications where the signals being received are extremely small. They need to go through a lot of amplification and it's very difficult to design linear amplifiers over a long, over a wide input range. So you're often getting this thresholding effect and therefore there's a preference in that case to use amplitude and phase shift keying. So hopefully this video has given you more insight into these differences. Uh, if it has, give it a thumbs up. It helps others to find the video. Um, subscribe to the channel for more videos and check out the webpage in the link below where you'll find a full categorized link of all the videos on the channel.